Welcome, welcome to Custom Importers 101. You're gonna learn learn some things today, I hope. Uh, my name is Jordan Thompson. Uh, I'm a Drupal Solutions lead at Northern Commerce. <coughs> I am a level six Drupaler, so I've been in the, the Drupal land for about six years, or or not six years. Yeah, six years, six and a half, six and a half. It's my little XP bar right there. Um, you can find me on Drupal.org at uh, Nord102. Um, some more things about me. Uh, I collect Funkos, if anyone knows what those are. They're like little figures. I got like way too many of them. Um, I also like Lego a lot. My desk is full of them at work. And uh, yeah, I like cool stuff. And this is cool. At least I think it's cool. So, so the agenda. Uh, what are importers? Available import methods. Why would you make a custom one as opposed to not? Uh, a little walkthrough of how to create one. Scheduling and automation and some gotchas. And this is the slide link for a PDF of the slides if you want it. So give a second for anyone who wants that. Um, and everyone else can look at our sweet office. Where are you looking at? Uh, we're located a little outside of Toronto, uh, Ontario, Canada. So it's, it was a bit of a journey to get here. <laughs> if my accent doesn't get it, give it away. I'm from Canada. <laughs> okay, has everyone got the bit.ly that wants the bit.ly? I'm seeing nods. Cool. Okay, so what are importers? Uh, they're tools that can be created and used uh, to make the process of creating large amounts of data from external sources easier while still having kind of some kind of control over that and and it's much better than you know manually importing content and bring stuff over so you think like you know it could be like a migration or it could be something that's coming from some external API or something and it just kind of works as expected and there's no manual entry so that's really the the big thing automation is key um, so current available import methods. So we can start with feeds. Um, it allows you for importing and aggregating data into content entities on a web, using a web interface. So you know it's a little nice UI, kind of like do your little mapping, um, and it's like pretty decent uh, for for that. And it doesn't really require a lot of coding either, um, unless you want to get into some tampering. So we can you know combine with feeds tamper where you know you can, can modify some stuff, do some pre-processing on that data before it actually goes in, you know, maybe the, you need to capitalize some stuff or you know do a little tweaking because no con no data is perfect when it comes in. It's always usually pretty bad. Um, and then you can also make your own uh, tampers as well, your own custom tampers to to, to kind of get anything that's not really out of the box. Then we also have the migrate API. So it's not just for migrations, but I find that, it, like, at least in my experience, it's, it's very common for that to be the key for migrations. <coughs> um, it provides lots of different APIs and tools uh, for importing data in. It uh, is very good from going from Drupal to Drupal, uh, but also works for any kind of other external source into Drupal. Um, you can make plugins. There are available plugins, available modules, contrib modules that you can kind of plug and play and really get a lot of functionality out of the box um, and kind of add it any kind of specific components that you need uh, based on your data. Uh, you know, such as like, you know, media stuff or um, yeah, other things. And then there's also the Q API. So hands up if you went to the Q uh, talk yesterday. Hey, yo. Mm -hmm. um, so this allows you to handle a number of tasks at a later stage. You can kind of make a bunch of queue items and then process them kind of whenever you want. It doesn't have to be right away. <coughs> it follows kind of a, a first in, first out methodology, which is nice. So anything that uh, you want the stuff in order, it's not going to just going to be one at whatever Drupal feels like you want to do. And just kind of a little summary on some of the steps. So it's using the queue interface. Um, you create an item, so you create a queue item. It kind of sits there, waits for the process. You claim it, which is kind of like the process part of it. 
if something goes wrong, you can release it. So it just kind of says, sorry, I don't know what happened, but I don't want to, like, I want to go to the next guy so we don't, like, completely kill our process. And then you can delete the item if you're done with it. So it's nice for the release because then you can see, like, oh, that one didn't go through. Maybe the data's corrupt. Maybe it's something weird with it. We can take a look. It's not just gone forever. Um, so why make a custom importer as opposed to some of those tools? And I'm actually going to be talking about more of the queue, uh, queue interface um, with mine. Um, so I'm a little biased because I like queues. <coughs> so feeds, they're a little limited in how much you can do with them, right? They're, 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 they're simple, they're good, they have tampers, sure. You can make hooks for them, sure, but there's only so much you can do even at the fact that you can customize them, right? So it works for simple cases, simple scenarios, but if you want to get anything complex, you know, it's like easy mode for, for, uh, for imports. And then there's Migrate, or the Migrate API. Um, I find that the Migrate API is a very steep learning curve. It's just like, there's a lot to, of knowledge to kind of funnel into your brain. And I even have a coworker that I was just talking to that says like, you know, she's, she does almost exclusively does migrations and there's still things that she doesn't understand when she looks at stuff and she has a problem and she still has to, you know, go down the Google train and figure out like, what is this thing? Um, so anyone who's mastered the, the Migrate API, hats off to you. Um, so yes, yeah, so you can use uh, plugins, you can make your own plugins, but there may or may not be intuitive to even make those plugins either. And um, <coughs> a big one too is you typically have to run multiple migrations. Uh, you know, in, like our imports due to kind of dependencies. So you know, if you if you want to make a node that references a taxonomy or a paragraph or a media, you got to make all those dependencies first, run that, and then run the actual node. So you might be running like you know five migrations just for you know one kind of one content type, but it has all these dependencies kind of connected to it. And then you have the queue API, which, um, again, we're going to dive deeper into, but you really have full control over that mapping, full control of the manipulation of the data. It's, it's very custom in, like, a good way and a bad way, I suppose. Like, that's that semi-downfall is it's so custom, but the good thing is it also because it's super custom, so you can kind of do whatever you want. Um, <coughs> you can perform multiple tasks in the same run, so... For example, I'll show um, pieces where it's like, if you want to create those taxonomy terms and those nodes kind of simultaneously, like you're going to make the taxonomy terms and then make the nodes right after, but it's kind of one run, you can do that. You don't have to necessarily do one and then do the other. I mean, you could, but you don't have to is kind of the point. Whereas you, you're kind of forced to do it in migrations. Like there are ways you can kind of go around it, but it's not, again, not necessarily the most intuitive to try to hack that in. Um, and you can also kind of combine import sources. So say you're reading in a CSV for an import, and then for some reason you had to make an API call randomly to like get some information. Again, Migrate's not super friendly for that. Like you, you kind of do one thing at a time, whereas again, custom, you kind of do whatever you want. So this is a little walkthrough again. This is gonna be a little biased on kind of like how I make importers. So take, take it with a grain of salt, but like hopefully you guys are on the, the same vibe as I am for importers. Uh, so typically I start with an administration form. And I like this because it allows them to, say, upload a file. So in this, all my examples, I'm just going to be talking about CSVs just because they're kind of easy. And, you know, we could work with something else, but we'll stick with something easy. Uh, so someone can upload that CSV, trigger the import. And it's nice because <coughs> even later when we're going to automate it, what if there's a scenario where we do need, you know, a quick fix and you don't, we don't want to wait till midnight for this thing to run and there's no other way to trigger it? So someone can quickly go in, run that if they want to, and then, you know, the, my content's saved. There, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, so that's what I like to start out with, and it's also pretty easy to test with as well. And then we make an import manager service. And <coughs> you can use this service to kind of have a central source of your information. I'll kind of go through different points of that. Um, and it can contain all your, your functions to populate your queues, helper functions, validation functions, kind of your one-stop shop for everything you need. And then we can use this kind of wherever we need to. 
So for example, um, we can have some import mapping. So as you can see here, this is just an example again of some kind of import mapping structure, but we have a title. Um, so sometimes I'll have like a queue directory where, you know, say if I'm importing a bunch of files, they'll sit in the queue directory. And then as I process them, I move them over to the archive directory. So I still have them if I need to look at them. Um, we have an expected header, which we'll go into for some validation. And then we also define our queues. And I'll get more into those types of queues in a little bit, but that, I kind of like to define my structure in one kind of central place. All my information's there. Um, so yeah. So kind of going into that, that file validation piece, I find that's really important uh, because I've had so many scenarios where, you know, file or we go to import something, say if it's overnight already, we already have that automation in, and oh, you know, the file limit is wrong or the header is wrong, and now, um, you know, the import process just kind of tanked, and we just lost a whole day doing that. Or someone's trying to import something and they mess something up because they accidentally put a comma instead of a pipe or a pipe instead of a comma. Um, so <coughs> I'll kind of walk through again a little deeper on, on some of those and some examples on that. But a, a tool that I find very useful is something called League CSV for CSVs. And it's kind of like my go-to tool for CSVs. It's really helpful. There's a lot of good functions in it. I've probably only like covered just the cusp of what it has to offer. Um, but the tools that I use from it are, are really handy. So for delimiter valid validation, for example, um, a mismatched delimiter could just, you know, make your importer not actually read in the data. If you're looking for commas, you're looking for pipes, um, you know, it won't parse the file properly. It might run into an error. It might try to like think, oh, this whole, this whole line is one, is the first column for some reason. And it's going to try to import that. And it's just going to run because it doesn't know any better, right? It's just going to go, oh, yep, I'm just doing my thing. And then like, you know, hours later, you're like, whoa, whoa, hold on. All my data's wrong. <coughs> um, so... I find that it's, it's helpful to set that delimiter and also make sure that, you know, you have that validation in place so that, you know, we're not running anything. I guess the key, too, is the validation is not running the import unless it's matched your, your, your business cases, your use cases, your expected behavior, right? So you don't want this to run, you know, night overnight and just it's not doing anything or it's doing something wrong. Um, so, for example, there's a little line right here. Um, this is a function from uh, League CSV, so it's called get delimiter stats. And you pass in your CSV, and you can actually pass in an array of delimiters. And what that does, it returns kind of like a count of how many of that delimiter it found. So if you're like wanting to double check of like what is my delimiter, so for I specify my file delimiter in my import manager. Uh, so like for example, in this scenario, I think I was using pipes. So I'm like, make sure it's pipes, and if we actually have uh, pipes in there. It's the count's greater than zero. Let's continue. If not, we're going to mark a flag saying, like, you failed your file header validation, or your delimiter validation, rather, and we're going to throw you an error, and we're not going to even attempt to import. Um, similar for header validation. So a mismatch can cause data to be imported, not to be imported, or imported incorrectly. So, for example, say you have a CSV with 15 columns, and one of those has a typo in it. Now you're missing that one piece of information. That could have been crucial information, too, that you're, you're now not importing. And now you're going to have to fix this. You're going to have to rerun the whole thing again. So you're kind of just wasted a bunch of time, right? Um, and then maybe you've accidentally imported something that was in the wrong column or something like that. So it just kind of gets messy, right? So really kind of setting that strict um, header and delimiter rules uh, can really help you save a lot of time and also save a lot of um, figuring out like what went wrong in my, in my import because it could run, fail, but you're like, oh, <coughs> my import's fine, but you know, there's a typo in like the 15th column header out of like 50 that you know, I had to like sift through and figure out. Um, so I've, I've run into these scenarios and that's why I put these things in place. So then I can tell people, no, the header's wrong. I know it for a fact. I run it. It gives me the error. It pops up. We're good to go. Um, so just a little example there. Um, so this is kind of the code that runs after uh, checking the delimiter. 
And really what it's doing, kind of just a summary here, is it's just kind of converting those, those headers in the file to kind of like a machine name style. And then we're uh, cross-referencing those with our expected header and our import mapping. And then, you know, if, there's a ma if we're matching, if we're all good, um, then it's going to set our, our has valid headers to true. If not, um, so you saw maybe earlier that there's a, like, a, like a keyed array there for those headers. And then it'll actually give them like a nice uh, string version of like, hey, these specific headers are wrong. It's not going to tell you that there's something wrong with your headers. It's going to say, you know, this specific one's wrong, it's spelled wrong or whatever, and that's one you need to fix. So it also helps them figure out what, the, what that point is because they might not know either that, that, that there's something wrong because they probably got that file from their data people and those people got it from some other data people and, you know, they're just importing it. Um, so getting into queue uh, population, so you also let um, have the import manager do this process as well. So it can read in that it, their file, your CSV file, for example, and make that kind of initial queue item with just all that data, just kind of bringing it in and getting it ready. And <coughs> excuse me, uh, one moment. You can actually um, have multiple queues. If you have multiple queues that you need to process, you can actually chain them using the batch API, which is kind of nice. So um, you'll see that I kind of have a queue that then makes queue items for another queue, and then just kind of keeps processing each other. Um, and if you kind of batch them together, it'll all run together. So you don't necessarily need to trigger one. Hopefully, it finishes in the time that you think it finishes, and then trigger the other one at some arbitrary time. Um, so. For example, here, mm -hmm. oh. Fisherman's friend. Thanks. I don't have like a like a real cough. Just for anyone who's scared, I have just a dry cough when I cough. Yeah. But thank you very much. Sure. I appreciate it. Um. Now you're gonna have a fisherman's friend cough. That's okay. <laughs> you get points. Bonus points. <laughs> There's a quiz later, and she already passed. Right. Um. Good so. <laughs> There's this data queue populate method that we have, so I'm uh, going to run through a few slides of what's in here. Um, so first step we do is we just kind of grab those queues from our import manager, and we're just going to clear them out. We don't want any old data that might be bad or anything like that. We just want to start fresh, and that's what this is doing. It's kind of like you know grabbing them, and then delete queue just kind of deletes all those queue items for them. Then we have our initial operation that's going to create that, that initial item. And I don't actually have the code snippet of what that queue create item does, but it's really just kind of getting the file contents of that CSV and just shoving it in one queue item and it, with uh, any kind of other details we need. And then the other operations we have are processing the get queue and the save queue, and I'll kind of dive a little deeper into what those are. Uh, but those kind of are our two pro our three processes really, but two of them are the are the main queues, if you will, the get queue and the save queue. And then at the end, we're just kind of throwing them all into a batch process and letting it run. So what is the get queue? Um, the get queue is responsible for for parsing the data and preparing it for the save queue. Um, so. I really, again, these aren't necessarily like standard things, it's just like things that I like to do. Um, so if you wanted to do this in a different order, feel free. Um, but while preparing the data, you can use the get queue to manipulate that data. So, you know, again, doing your string manipulation, if you want to map any values, kind of structuring any of that content. What if you have, you know, yeah, like lat long pairs that you want to put in an array as opposed to having them two different separate columns, you can do that. So sky's the limit, it really depends on your content. But really this is kind of like the preparation stage. And then with that get queue, um, we typically have comprised of like a base class and a manual class. Um, now the base class is an abstract class that extends the queue worker base. This is where all the kind of the generic get functionality is gonna be. So parsing that data and creating queue items for the save queue. So Really, our, our get queue processes the full file and kind of splits it up into smaller chunks. So you don't necessarily want to have one queue item with like you know thousands of things to process. 
because that's really going to slow stuff down, right? Think about like if one queue of a hundred, that's going to, you know, as it's going, it's going to start chugging, right? It's going to take up your memory. It might even time out or like run out of memory or something. But if you had 10 of those with 10 each, it'd be quick, boom, 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 and, you know, works like a charm. It really kind of also depends on your content, but I find, yeah, the lower the number of queue or like the things in your queue item, even if you have more queue items, it still go pretty quick. Like you think, oh, I have 500 queue items with like so much each, but it's it's going to be much faster than, well, than what you think. Now, the manual class extends the base class, and this is where kind of your more specific mapping can live, while, um, and it's intended to override um, some of the base class. Now, something that's useful is you can have multiple manual classes. So, for example, I have an import and the reading the CSV is the same thing because they're both CSVs. I still want to parse them the same way. But the mapping, the, the data inside the file is different for each of these, so they have their own manuals that are still extending that, that base. So you don't necessarily have to make a whole new uh, module to you know, have two different imports. It really can, can service multiple. Um, so I have, for example, in my example I have two, you could have five, it doesn't really matter, as long as it's kind of inheriting the same thing. And Again, because you can override those, you can kind of do whatever you want. Um, I will make a note, it's not in my slides, it's kind of my gotchas, but um, you can also have queues run on cron if you intend them to. So there's like a little like kind of flag of like run on cron runs. And the, the manual is also a little misleading as well. It just means that like you're not necessarily manually triggering it, but you are like it's not being triggered by anything else but something that is being run like a drush command or something. So for example, we have process item, parse CSV data, clean index, and then our process data, which is intended to be uh, overridden by our manual classes. So this is the base. And just a little bit um, of that, that process item. So we're um, getting the records. I guess I'm, these are kind of out of order. We parse the CSV first, and then we're going to go through the records. Uh, I did these in a weird order, so apologies for that. Um, so these are some functions, again, coming from League CSV, which are really nice. So you can read in the data, you set the delimiter, you set the enclosure, you set that your header is the first row, and then it just grabs it, grabs it all. So it's nice and and uh, nice and nice easy. And then you loop through those records, um, you know, maybe you do some cleanup of your, your header keys, the process data is going to run all that kind of mapping. And then this is also where we're grouping those, and you can see that we're creating those items based on, you know, some number of groups. So for example, I think I have mine set to, I think the item number of rows is set to like 100 or something like that. So it's Q items of 100. Um, and just kind of keeps doing those and if, you know, just kind of makes a bunch. So after the get queue makes all of those, uh, so sorry, it makes save queue items. So then the save queue then can process those. So all of that data is now processed. It's ready to be saved and now we're going to save it. And we don't necessarily want to do those in the same step because, again, that's, you know, more effort for the system to do. We need a nice, quick um, step of very specific, like, processing and then a very specific save. We don't necessarily want to... We can combine them, like, but, again, the more stuff you're doing in a, in a process, the, you know, the heavier it's going to be. Um, so prior, prior to saving the data, so say we're, we're importing nodes or something... Um, you can check whether or not that content already exists, you know, maybe based on some unique import ID or some combination. Um, if it doesn't, we'll create it. If it does, we'll update it. If there's content references that it needs to, to reference, we can then check for those, see if those need to be created or updated, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We can also make translations, for example. We can do all this in the same kind of uh, run. And again... We have come back, kind of come back to our base and our manual. So the base uh, has that generic stuff. So checking whether or not it needs to create or update, and handling, you know, creating, updating references, translations, stuff like that's all very generic code, right? And then our manual actually has like a field mapping. So all of those keys, and again, you could maybe do some of that field mapping in the get too, 
um, but I find it's handy to do that on the save. So we, we go, we grab our mapping, and it just kind of takes uh, a look at, you know, oh, this is our, our keys from our file matching um, our fields, and maybe, you know, the structure's a little different because maybe we have to make a paragraph or we need to make a taxonomy term, so those structures are a little different of, you know, how we check if a taxonomy term already exists. We need to check the name probably because it's probably coming as a string, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, so, again, uh, if you had uh, use for more than one manual, you could do that. So the mappings are different. But again, they're still using that base functionality to save or update or create. Um, so our base, again, has kind of a process, the get mapping, which is for overriding. We have like a get node ID um, that's checking based on some arbitrary comparing field. Uh, we update it or we create it. Um, and then there's more functions below, but it's just kind of just the, the gist, if you will. Um, now, <coughs> our queues aren't necessarily limited to get and save, but they are kind of the most common. You get your information, you, you per, like process it, and then you save it. Uh, but there could be other queues that you want to run before, after, in between. Really kind of depends on your use case, but uh, some examples... Um, are like a clean queue, so you know maybe we need to delete content that doesn't matter anymore. We orphan some some paragraphs because you know we don't need that anymore. We can do that. Um, or you know if we have an update, so um, something that needs to happen within context. So for example, I have a real life example. So we have one where imports taxonomy terms. Those initial taxonomy terms have a reference to another taxonomy, mm -hmm. and then there are nodes that also reference that secondary taxonomy. So we import the first taxonomy in the get and the save, and then we have an update to check to see if which nodes are uh, referencing the same secondary taxonomy, and then we get the node to then reference the taxonomy that we're importing. I know that sound, kind of sounds confusing, but like you see how you wouldn't really be able to do that in like a migrate or anything like that? Like it's, it's very specific. Um, so something like that could be run after you've done all your saving and stuff. Um, and after all that, you probably want to make a drudge command um, because you know you want to be able to eventually automate this, eventually schedule this, probably, and we can just leverage all the things that we did in our import manager because you know the form can use it, our drudge command can use it. It doesn't really matter what's using it because it's just a service; anyone can use it. Um, and then the only difference that really is like how the drush command is getting that data, so obviously no one's uploading that file, but assuming that file we can point to whatever directory we want because it's a custom form, we can put it in the same queue directory that we talked about before, and it just grabs it and goes or grabs a URL from somewhere, uses that. Um, so getting into import scheduling and automation, why would you even schedule an import? It allows us to not manually trigger it, right? You don't have to sit at your computer at like midnight and say, yep, I'm going to press that button every day for the rest of the week. The rest of my life. The rest of my life, I'm just the import guy. Granted, I did used to have to do that before I had a manual or a, a scheduled thing. Be like, oh, yeah, can you just run that after hours? And it's just going to take like three hours. So you have to like watch your computer and make sure it doesn't fail. <laughs> like, you got it. <laughs> But, and then, you know, you can also have this coordinated with other processes. So, for example, if you have an external source that's doing kind of like a publish or a drop-off into your queue folder, so maybe that does that at 1 a.m., and then you have your process run at 2 a.m., for example. So you can time that a little nicer with other things. Um, I even have certain scenarios where we have an import like that, but we all ha also have an export. So we export it to it there, and then they grab it at another time. So it's, it's nice for just being able to schedule all that kind of stuff. And how to schedule that, cron jobs and cron tabs. Uh, so a cron tab, cron table, is a file that contains schedule all cron entries, cron jobs, specific set of execution instructions, <coughs> specifying when and what to execute. And this is kind of the syntax. Hopefully that's sort of easy to read. <laughs> it's probably not, but that's okay. Um, so you can do it by minute, hour, day of the month, month, day of the week, and then the command. Now you might think, oh, that's kind of confusing. <laughs> How do I figure this stuff out? I have this lovely handy dandy reference down here, so I'm gonna stop sharing for just a sec here and go to this cron tab guru. It's pretty sweet um, if you've never seen this before, so I'm just gonna fill it in. So it shows you actually like what this will be, 
and kind of the syntax and if you get something wrong because there's not really that kind of error checking when you when you fill these out so you know say I want this to run every five minutes I can do that and it tells me every fifth minute you know what if I wanted this to run in January I can do that and it's it's nice and it does that you can do like ranges you can do like you know like <laughs> Monday to Saturday, right? But it's nice that it validates that you're like, oh, okay, I got this right. Literally almost every time I do a cron job, I have I go to this site, I fill it out just to make sure I'm not crazy, that it's valid, and then I'll copy it, put it into where I'm going to. What is it, cron tab? Cron tab dot guru. Yeah. It's pretty handy. Uh, the link is also on the slides as well, too. Um, but yeah, this is like a lifesaver. Just saying. Um... Now there is a caveat too. I think like some systems don't like this kind of like every five minutes kind of thing. So your mileage may vary on some of these things, but more or less like Acquia likes this kind of stuff. Pantheon probably likes this kind of stuff. So it kind of depends. Um, so going back into here, some examples, every five minutes, every hour, very specific times every day, Monday to Friday at noon, or midnight, January 1st. I have a, literally a scheduled job that runs December 31st of every year at a very specific time because it does like a yearly report. And I can do that because it lets me. So it's pretty cool. Um, and then getting into gotchas. So um, as I kind of mentioned before, the, the, the con of custom importers is because they're custom, there's not really anything out of the box to start with. Granted, I have kind of a structure that I use, so I really kind of have like a skeleton that I start with every time, and then I you know, fill in the, the blanks as I need to. Um, wrapping your head around the QAPI can be a little bit of a learning curve, but again, if you remember, not as much as a learning curve as Migrate. I think we're all in agreement there. Migrate API is like up here. QAPI, it takes a little bit, but it's not like years of learning, <laughs> like going to the library and, and reading a book. Um, uh, queue will get processed when cron runs unless you exclude cron from your queue annotation. So I kind of touched on this a little bit, but I had a scenario where someone had put that annotation in, so it's like, tells you like, oh yeah, it's going to run a cron, and then it kept running every hour, and I was like, why are you running? You're supposed to be running at midnight. And then I said, oh, there's that little cron thing there, let's take that out and then it's not going to trigger anymore. But sometimes you might want that, right? You might want every hour or however you run cron um, to trigger that without having like a drush command that does that. Um, and then custom importers don't, nest, don't inherently have the same ability to roll back as migrate does. So that's like a big one, sure. If you, if you don't have that rollback, it could be bad. Um, but I'm sure there's ways to build it in if you needed to. It's not like it's impossible, but... It's just not out of the box. Um, and then for scheduling, I found that time zones and daylight savings time are the worst. Because, <laughs> you know, you're trying to convert these. So, for example, I, I put it in. It's like, okay, so I have to convert the times I want to, like, UTC and then worry about daylight savings time on top of that. <laughs> so I've had scenarios where, you know, it doesn't run on the right time or it doesn't run on the right day. Mm. Daylight savings time actually moved it to the day before. Because I like to run stuff you know, like between midnight and 5, and it accidentally run it at, like, 11 the day before, and it screwed everything up. So, yeah, like... I had, a, I had a newspaper that their servers were in a different time zone, so it did that every all the time. Yeah. Was like, and I just said, it's going to happen. It gets me every time. I have to use... I literally have to use a site of, like, you know, like... So I'm in EST, so it's, like, EST to UTC. Make sure my cron, because then you have to change your cron job to you work in UTC and not in EST. So it's a little confusing, a little hard, hard to wrap your head around. Um, also, when you're scheduling overnight, there's not necessarily a guarantee that it's not going to fail or it won't have an error because you're not watching it, right? But if you have logging in place, so you can at least see, you know, oh, hey, it failed because the file header was wrong. Or, you know, this ran as expected. I can kind of see an output of like, yep, running, 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 running. We're good to go. So logging is key. I will say that for sure. It saved me more than once of just like, hey, it didn't work. Can you figure, can you figure it out? Um, so yeah. And that's about it. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to ask. You can also clap.
I could do a live demo, but it's gonna take a while. I have I have an importer that imports. Um, so here's this is a little story time before anyone asks a question. Um, I have an importer that runs, and there's 300,000 files or not files uh, lines in a file. And then I have a process, so this file gets dropped off. We actually have um, a bash script that then s chunks that into uh, smaller files of 5,000 each. Because even reading in that initial file load is heavy, right? And then you might, might throw an error. Trying to even make a Q item with that, like that much stuff is, is pretty heavy too. So we chunk it. Then we, we do the same get save process on all those 5,000. But we can only run so much a night because it takes so long. So it t takes about like a week to run, and we run maybe like 60k a night wow. in between certain hours. And then like I turn on maintenance mode in as part of my import process. So my drush command runs, it turns on its maintenance mode, runs our import, do do do. I've ran you know how many files, turn off maintenance mode, happy day. Something else that's real that's kind of key too. I've ran too is sometimes you run out of memory. You can actually increase your, your memory just for that kind of run. So you can temporarily increase that memory um, such that it can run all this stuff. And because I run it overnight, it doesn't really affect too many people. So um, yeah, I like to run things overnight. Not that you have to run things overnight, but heavy stuff like that, especially on a site, the specific site a lot of users use. And if like for some reason something was being updated while they're trying to access stuff, not a good time. Anyways. Enough rambling by me. Uh, any questions or comments? Uh, question. So I have used Migrate API for images. Like yep. Sometimes you, uh, so can you use custom importer to like reference images also, like have to import image and then map it in your... As long as you have some kind of source for those images. I've done one where um, we've imported and that image has like a URL somewhere. So we've grabbed that, that image via that URL and then created like a media and then like grab, like make that file, make the media and then uh, have that node reference it. So you could do it for sure. It really kind of depends on like the, your source data. But yeah, you could totally do that. What about running cron on a seconds um, granularity? So say you have something that runs every minute Mm -hmm. You have to make sure it runs before you run the second thing, and so you want to trigger that at thirty seconds. Yeah, so that is a is hard because it's you don't want to try to run multiple things at the same time, which has happened to me as well. I've accidentally mm -hmm. in that scenario where I was running you know sixty k night, the first batch wasn't done yet, so then it's trying to run the second batch, but then the second batch is trying to run part of the first batch, and then there's kind of overlapping, and then you have database locks and you know what have you. Um, it really kind of depends, I guess, on what you're importing. Um, and I mean, sometimes it's just not feasible to run it quick. And like, it's just kind of is what it is. It really depends on how heavy it is. Like if you're just, uh, you know, importing and you're not, they say, checking for existing content, maybe that's the, the key. If you're just straight importing something or, uh, yeah, it, it's kind of hard. I do have one that runs every minute. It's not as big as that 300,000, um, but, it's it's really just like kind of like checking if like you know say twenty things are are still existing and if it doesn't exist in some kind of source list it'll delete it. Um, so it, again, kind of depends on how heavy it is. Um, the one that three hundred thousand one also has like fifty columns. So like you can also think that's even heavier, right? Because that's how many fields. Most of those are taxonomy terms. So then again, that's even heavier. So yeah, kind of depends. I'm just curious, who do you like to have as the author of these, I'm assuming like nodes, but like, like, do you have a special user so that you can kind of tell that the importer did it? Um, good question. Uh, I think it, like, I think it typically just, well, I don't know, I guess I specify like the site super, like user, um, mm -hmm. and usually you can kind of tell because like all of their timestamps are the same, Yeah. more or less. Um, but yeah, that is a good question. Like, I could s see a scenario where you'd have like a specific user just for the sake of like, this is the import doing this. Yeah, yeah. Because um, there's, I have a scenario where you know it's an events importer, mm -hmm. but events don't necessarily need to be a lot like they don't have to be imported. So other users can make them. Right. 
if like they wanted to. Pathway, yeah, right. but some of but the main ones are being imported. Mm -hmm. So, but granted, you'd see like, oh yeah, Site Super made these, and it's probably not someone manually making those. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's a good question. Any other questions, concerns, question? Uh, what do you do when an item is failing? Like, it couldn't process the item. You mentioned some logging. But what about if it's like, like in my scenario, uh, there's an import job for a Ticketmaster API, creates events, you know, continuously. It's not like a single time import. Mm -hmm. I'm not monitoring the job. The client has that running, you know, in the background. I get called in when the events are not coming in, and it's like three months uh, an item hasn't been released. You know, it can be cleared because it's airing out. Right. Uh, is there a way you, like, can program it to get deleted or, you know, the, the Q item try, retries and retries and retries and it just gets stuck. I think when you, so when you are kind of like looping over them to, to like claim them, yeah. uh, if you release them, they'll give, get an expiry date in like the Q table. Okay. And then when, I believe when cron runs and that ex expiration date's in the past, it'll kill it. Um, so, like, the good news is that it'll kind of set that so, like, it doesn't try to do what you're saying. Like, try to keep running it forever. Um, so, yeah, so, like, even in the scenario where you had five of them and, like, the second one has a problem, yeah. it'll say, sorry, problem, release you, let's go to the third guy. Because he might not have a problem. But granted, if, you're, if it's like, an import thing, like your code, they're all going to have problems. But if it's, like, data-wise, yeah. it'll just say, sorry, I need to let you go, which is... Probably the best case scenario, so it's not just chugging, trying to import the same thing over and over. Yeah. Uh, but you will like you know lose that data. But again, it's probably a data thing at that point. Yeah, it is definitely is. But it just happens that you know thousands of items got imported, but eventually you know one day yeah, you, one you hit one. It. So when the next time it tries, it tries to process the first hundred ones, and they're all failing again. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I would yeah recommend releasing them if they if they hit an exception. Um, yeah, that's that's how I have mine set up. So it's just it's a little more foolproof that way. Yeah. Um, and I suppose too, you could probably toss in some logging to give you more context of what the thing it's releasing too. Like if you need to see like what data was in there, maybe you can log some of that before you release it, kind of thing. Because you'll still have the item mm -hmm. before you you let it go into the the, the void. Um, but yeah, no, I have a lot of logging in mind, so it, it's constantly going, and if it hits something, it, more more times than not, I'll, I'll know where, where it's failing. Um, but if there, there are scenarios where I just have to put a lot of check checkpoint logging in, and then it just run, and hopefully it hits all the things that I need to. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Any other questions? I'm trying to, to wrap my head around why you would need three hundred thousand taxonomy terms. <laughs> well, they're not they're not different terms. They're they're all okay. like okay. There's maybe say like ten, but there's three hundred thousand yeah. nodes that then reference those same ten, and then I don't necessarily know that this one already got created. Yeah. So I have to check and then you know grab the TID and then associate it and oh what if it's now changed to like you know this other one I have to make sure that one's created and do it so new one or yeah it's it does it's a heavy process just because of that and then like um, fortunately there's like no media involved because again that would be even more processing um, yeah it's just like the amount of content and the fact that like there's like 20 of them are like taxonomy terms so it's just like a lot to, to process but again if you have um, like all your all those functions that do all that are very generic, just like you know, oh yeah, I have some taxonomy term. I like that mapping I do kind of gives it what I need to compare it with. You know, if there's an import ID or just the name of the taxonomy, and then it kind of works its magic. So yeah, and again, the good news too is like if I need to make a new importer, most of that generic code in the base I can just reuse, unless like I need to do something more specific. Um, but it's very generic, and I just have to change the mapping, and it's kind of like plug and play in a little bit. I am actually working on like kind of like a scaffold right now for those, um, just because that's what I kind of do anyways. But it'd be nice to have like an actual like scaffold, like fold, like module, not module, but like kind of uh -huh. that you could just kind of shove in, and then you know you're already like you know sixty percent there, and you just got to fill in the, the details. So. Go Q's. Woo. Thank you.
where outside of Toronto are you? Uh, London, Ontario. Okay. We just say Toronto because no one really knows where yeah. London is. <laughs>